chance to get 30% boys also into the campus. This is the most difficult part of the whole program, getting colleges, especially residential colleges. Ordinary day colleges, they can call or they can spread out the students in the classroom and conduct the classes. That is possible. But for residential colleges, how do we do it? It's very, very difficult to conceive that inside the hostel there can be social distancing, where each in each room in first year there are seven boys. In your uh, new wing and east wing, east wing and west wing, I think you have three to four boys in each room, four boys in each room. So it's very, very difficult, very, very difficult. Let's see what happens. In the meantime, let us proceed with our subject. You keep yourself updated. You keep yourself well informed and uh, go through the examinations. The examinations are going to be very light. I'll give you one piece of advice right now. The examinations are going to be conducted on a very light level. You know, a lot of boys will think, oh, we have such a good time. We are going to pass very easily. But you know, this, this stigma, this stigma of doing the examination during the COVID year is going to remain with you for years. That in 2020, you'll you'll pass the exam without really and without any real examinations. So you'll have just been pushed through. You'll have not been tested. So you're not equal to other boys who have actually gone through the whole process with thorough examinations, with uh, with all the checks and balances that are being made in a normal exam. That is why there's a big joke about the class 12 candidates who are passing out this time, that high secondary boys and all that, that they have just passed because of consideration because of COVID. So in future, that class 12 certificate will not have any relevance when compared to other students who come in the next few years with genuine examinations. So from your part, be very thorough with your subject, be able to answer questions. And you see this particular semester examination is going to be on a test on a webinar. How it's got, got to do with engineering, it beats me. So anyway, we have to follow out some procedure to help us get through the whole semester. And while the classes are on, be very, very thorough with your classes. Be well informed on your subject matter so that at a later date you say sir it wasn't done because of covid don't blame covid for everything if there is a will there is a way you will learn everything if you want to learn and you will learn nothing if you don't want to learn it's like that so let's proceed with the subject i will try to keep it as brief as ever to ensure that you get your subject matter and at the same time you should be able to answer questions have a piece of paper or a diary. Paper gets lost. So have a diary or a register beside you while you're hearing me out. Because there's a lot of information I will give you as it comes to my mind. So those little bits of information you write down and make a note of it. Not everything is stated in the PowerPoint program. So that is why you need to be updated with the information that is coming to you through verbal instructions. There's a lot of information on that, and uh, that's the way we can proceed. If we don't proceed, we remain stagnant somewhere we are. As it is, it has taken a heavy toll on all of you regarding your updating in engineering technical subjects. Those having non-technical subjects, for them it's a breeze, because it's no problem. But for engineering candidates especially, it is very tough to have online training, online classes. And DG Shipping has postponed the practical part, which makes it more complicated. That means you are allowed to go through everything in your theoretical side. At a later date, you have to come and do your practical exam, which is a bother because how they are going to do it is another big new planning program that is be necessary. Anyway, we have 28 candidates as of now. This is section C, uh, sorry, section uh, D. So section D has got 38 boys. Oh. Pratham Joshi and Prashant Kumar Mishra. I hope both of you are there. I have not been checking. Uh, please share last week's lecture recording. Piyush, I think 
you know what i have tried i tried to share the whole lecture with everybody's email and it backfired on me the whole thing just did not go so i suggest you send me an email asking to share so when i click on that then it gives me the share option and immediately i can put it on share and put it across to you i think i've been doing that to a lot of students and they have been receiving it and there has been no remark that it has not reached them so i think it has reached them satisfactorily so you send me an email i know my email gets loaded with 30 40 emails at one time but one by one one by one i keep forwarding it to all of you so do send me an email it will help me to put you through with the lecture program and once i finish this powerpoint program for all six sections i will send the powerpoint program itself to the class in charges and they will share it with all of you so you have a ready re reference for your notes and all my notes are gradually being translated into a powerpoint program i'm leaving out what is unnecessary and i'm continuing with what is uh, relevant to your syllabus i have your syllabus right here and it's i'm referring to that regularly but your syllabus also lacks a few basic fundamental parts of the subject which he has, he wants it seems that it is going to be a purely a mechanical transfer of mugged up information it doesn't make sense you need to know some fundamental principles behind how engines work you need to know what is volumetric efficiency you need to know what is flash point you need to know what is ignition point these are not even mentioned here and yet they have said description of engine oh it has got a cylinder head it has got tie rod these things are you know uh, because at a later date you will have issues if you don't know your fundamentals well once you know the fundamentals well you'll be very very thorough one of the parts of your fundamentals is knowing the timing diagram i have given you I have that very well understood and also the reasons why you have overlap the why the ports in the cylinder liner have got angles to them thing like that if you have more questions do not hesitate to put them down on the chat column and i will address each of those uh, questions to absolute clarity because some boys may not feel bold enough to ask the question uh, you must be bold if one of what two of you be bold so the information gets across to all of you so that will be a good way of learning your subject matter let us start with our subject i know 30 there are still some boys who are to come in possibly my thing will disappear at the moment so let us start with what we have as compression ratio this is one place where some boys make mistakes when i ask the question what is the minimum compression ratio required of a diesel engine i have got answers in the on in the examination saying for two stroke engines it is 12 and four stroke engine it is 14 to 16 that is no answer you get a zero for it though you have mentioned 12 why have you mentioned it is 14 to 16 for four stroke engines that is not the right answer you make your answer as simple and straight forward as the question is what is the minimum compression ratio of a diesel engine right the minimum compression ratio of a diesel engine is 12 that's all or 12 is to 1 for two stroke or four stroke it is the same it is not different yet i find in answers that they have given 14 16 for four stroke and for two stroke it is two stroke it's not true i have not asked the question is not what is the compression ratio of a two stroke engine and what is the compression ratio of a four stroke engine so why does the student write for two stroke it is 12 and four stroke it's 14 i have just asked what is the compression ratio of a diesel engine it's 12 all right do not complicate the answer straight forward answers and always when you start the answer start with the words that are written in the question like right? what is the minimum compression ratio of a diesel engine right your answer should be the minimum compression ratio of a diesel engine is 12 is to 1 or just 12 that is the way you answer the question 
because you tend to write a lot of irrelevant subjects. Make the folder of the videos according to section and then turn on the link sharing with the sharing the link to what one. That will have to reach the video without accepting any error. Okay, I will read the rest. This is flying above my head. Make a folder of the videos according to the section. Then it will occupy so much space in my laptop. I won't have any place to put in more information. Okay. That that won't that won't be the issue because you would be moving the particular sections video in that particular folder, na? That would be like shifting uh, shifting the videos to the particular section, the desired section, and then turning on the uh, sharing uh, uh, turning on the link share would help everyone to reach it, and you won't have to accept individual requests. Okay, so then I can share. I can put the link in everybody's email address, and you all should be able to connect. Isn't that right? You can you can share the link to anyone, like you are giving to Pratham Joshi, our CI, and he would be sharing it to us. That would be sufficient. That would do okay. the work. Okay, okay, right on. So Ravi, I will first try it out with you. I will give you the link and see if you can read it through. And then when you give me the green signal, I will put it to everybody. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. Now let's go through our PowerPoint plates. And if there is some information I give you that is not on the PowerPoint, have it written down. So everybody knows now the minimum compression ratio is normally 12 is to 1. It is not that all engines will have 12 is to 1 because there has been improvement in technology. And that improvement in technology comes with improvement in compression ratios also. 12 is to 1 is the most minimum, or rather is the minimum. Now, <clears throat> you can have 14, you can have 16, you can have 18, you can have 20. The highest I have come across is 21, but information from outside tells me right now the technology has improved to bring about compression ratios to 23 is to 1. All right. Why 23 is to 1 and why not 26 is to 1? I will let you know just now. Pay full attention. Let's first read through this plate and then I will give you. The higher compression ratio is 12 is to 1. It is much higher than your petrol engines, which have 8 to 9 as your compression ratio. Your gasoline or petrol engines or spark ignition engines have a compression ratio of 8 to 9. Okay. This enables easy starting on auto ignition principle. Auto ignition is without the application of any external flame or spark or source of light. That is why it is called auto ignition. That means the temperature of that oil is so high that it catches fire on its own. Higher compression ratio gives rise to higher peak pressure. That's true. If the compression ratio is higher, the peak pressure becomes higher. All right. Supercharging increases the pressure ratio and therefore the peak pressure. Supercharging is introducing air at a pressure above atmospheric in the cylinder before the compression starts. The moment you have air at a pressure above atmospheric, it means the mass of air you have put inside is much more. So you can burn more fuel. Moment you burn more fuel, the bang is much more and the peak pressure is much higher. Okay. Strength of the component limits the maximum pressure in the combustion chamber of engine. This is the key element in deciding the compression ratio. You see, if the compression ratio is high, the peak pressure is high. So ultimately, it is the peak pressure which causes the maximum stresses within the combustion chamber walls. Okay. Now, <clears throat> steel or metal that we use for our combustion chamber has its limitation where strength is concerned. Now, you cannot have more and more and more and more peak pressures because the stress will become more and more and more till such time it fails. So, there is a limit to which the peak pressure can be permitted inside the combustion chamber. And this is decided by <clears throat> what is called factor of safety. Factor of safety means the margin between the working stress and the ultimate stress at which failure takes place. So power of safety, POS, you can write down, is equal to ultimate tensile stress divided by working stress. All right. 
every engineering component every machinery component has a factor of safety especially where safety is necessary even a chair which i am sitting on uh, my weight is 65 kg but this chair can easily take double my weight so the factor of safety is 2 all right because at double my weight the chair might fail okay if two of us sit on it chair will fail that means 130 kg it will fail which is the ultimate tensile stress and working stress peak working stress may be little more let's say 65 is the um, allowable maximum stress so it has a factor of safety of 2 so that is how power fact power of safety is decided for any engineering component which is subject to stress crankshafts have a power, safety factor of 3 to 3.5 so that is why the maximum load on the crankshaft is still not enough to cause it damage three times that maximum will cause it to damage so that margin is much bigger in some components and lesser in some components all right okay uh, increase of temperature only increases the thermal load of the components what is thermal load thermal load is stress arising out of a differential temperature thermal load means a stress arising out of a differential temperature that means if one side of the wall i hope you cannot see me yeah you can see me uh, uh, a stress arising out of a temperature differential suppose this side of the wall is 400 degree centigrade and this side of the wall is 100 degree centigrade so this side is going to expand more but this side is not going to allow that expansion so the stress caused within one surface to the other surface will cause it to crack so that is called thermal loading or thermal fracture okay ultimately thermal stress is also physical stress all right and mechanical stress is due to mechanical forces so you have two types of loading in the combustion chamber one is thermal loading of oh, somebody is come one is thermal loading and one is mechanical loading mechanical loading mm, 29 mechanical loading is on account of mechanical loading is on account of the gas pressures which are acting so your cylinder liner your combustion chamber on top and your piston crown all three walls which make up the combustion chamber are subject to mechanical stresses as well as thermal stress all right now <clears throat> the biggest contradictory part of this problem is you cannot make the walls very thick and strong so it can take the mechanical stresses because if you make it very thick and strong then the thermal stresses will become very high then the heat transfer through the thick wall it takes much more time so the stress on one side is much more on the other side so the thermals the walls of the combustion chamber cannot be too thick and it cannot be too thin there has to be a compromise between thickness and thinness all right okay uh thermal load next is the upper limit of pressure will have to be fixed by considering the strength of the material of the liner cylinder cover the bearings and other parts whose safe working depends on the mechanical and thermal load of the engine now bearings connecting rod mid crosshead bearing bottom end bearing they are under mechanical load thermal load and mechanical load is only within the combustion chamber okay so within the combustion chamber what all are the mechanical and thermal components the cylinder liner the piston crown the top piston ring and then the next piston ring also but lesser than the first top piston and the cylinder cover so these are the surfaces which are subject to mechanical and thermal stresses all right and how strong they are mechanically is dependent on the ultimate tensile strength of that steel so based on that and with a factor of safety you design what should be the peak pressure okay so the peak pressure is dependent on the strength of the material used for building that engine okay i 
of now who's come it's already 49 now rajiv saharan he still don't have all the boys in class okay so you have understood on what basis is peak pressure determined it is determined on the strength of the material and now strength of the material is not enough you cannot afford to have a very thick wall of the combustion chamber and you can't afford to have a very thin wall also so it has to be a compromise between the thickness and thinness to come to allow for that peak pressure to be built in now <clears throat> to minimize thermal stress we provide for cooling of the surfaces all right to take out maximum heat before the expansion can take place that is what okay these are the constraints regarding compression ratio and high pressure in the cylinder ultimately the strength of the engine now one point which is not mentioned here oh the last point is the compression ratio can vary between 12 is to 1 to 23 is to 1 in modern diesel engines one thing that is not mentioned here whether they are large bore engines medium speed engines or high speed engines now in large bore engines you cannot afford to have a very high compression ratio in medium speed engines you can have a reasonably high compression ratio high speed engines you can definitely have very high compression ratio why okay pressure multiplied by the cross sectional area is the force okay ultimately the force on the top of the piston all right will determine how much thickness the piston crown has to be okay now if you make it very thick then it becomes the problem that one side the temperature will be very high other side temperature will blow so it will crack so you cannot afford to have a very high peak pressure in a two stroke engine but you can afford to have a peak pressure in a medium speed and a high speed engine because the cross sectional area is large therefore pressure multiplied by area ultimately gives the force all right this is one <clears throat> number two the bearings which are at the bottom ultimately the brunt of the force on top of the piston has to be taken up by the bearings so the bearing designs will also have to be arranged to give the maximum area of taking the load if you have a small area and the force is large then the pressure per unit area becomes very large then uh, material has to be white metal which is soft reasonably soft and it will not be able to take the load so that is why compression ratio in large bore engines is less compression ratio in small bore engines is higher okay next plate next we go on to mean effective pressure now try to get this concept very clear when i i am explaining to you okay now when there is a combustion inside the cylinder it is the force on the piston which makes the crank rotate all right if we need to calculate how much power is concerned how much power is being developed we need to know how much force is being applied on the piston to cause torque or rotation of the crankshaft okay but the most difficult part is to calculate that how much force and it has to be a steady force but there is no steady force inside the cylinder when the engine is working why because when the piston is near tdc and the combustion takes place at that point of time the pressure is highest all right so that pressure starts dropping as the piston keeps coming down so from the tdc to the bdc the pressure sorry the pressure on the piston crown is reducing there is no uniform pressure i hope everybody understands that now because there is no uniform pressure we cannot calculate the force to enable calculating the force we need to to conceive the concept of a steady pressure and that steady pressure is called mean effective pressure all right because there is no steady pressure on the piston the pressure keeps varying right through the stroke so how are we going to calculate the power 
so we have to conceive or make a steady pressure and that pressure is called mean effective pressure so it is called it is that theoretical pressure which may be assumed to act on the piston during the power stroke it is a theoretical value it is not really happening on the piston but it is the average pressure from the peak pressure to the lowermost pressure when the pressure is released for exhaust so that average pressure has to be calculated how do we calculate that average pressure okay there is a great variation in the pressure in the cylinder during a cycle of operation okay that is understandable because the piston comes down and the pressure keeps varying and i have shown you that pv diagram which shows at no point is the pressure uniform or horizontal nikhil kishore singh is coming now after class is over okay prashant and uh, pratham i will need the attendance at the end of the class that means you will have to find out who all are present and accordingly you will uh, give me the absentee names i am your headquarters has become very very difficult with this particular issue they need the attendance regularly that is why i am keeping on you prashant that you identify who all are absent till the end of the class and on the basis of that nishit shaw has left the meeting nishit shaw is absent prashant so you mark him absent because he has left the meeting just now it's coming to my screen so it's not very difficult to identify but i need the names of absentees of the class at the end of the class so everybody should be there okay uh so we were discussing about the average pressure sir. that is act uh what is it so sometime due to network problem we have to left the meeting and then rejoin then it was okay. good sir. okay okay towards the end of the class right now it is 34 and it should be actually 38 plus to 40 so that means um 32 boys are here right now in attendance because two are my uh, my numbers over there out of 34 actually 32 boys are in attendance so our two are been taken up as my presentation so 32 and 30 that means six boys are absent you will have to find out who all are absent and accordingly give me the list of absentees and the other class in charges are doing the same chubanka singh sumit das paran akdas and who are the others kundan kumar yeah okay so i hope you are able to understand the concept of mean effective pressure there is no steady pressure on the piston it is an average pressure which has to be calculated okay uh, how is it calculated we will not go too deep into the subject but it, because it goes into the sixth semester procedure but remember that pv diagram that comes out we 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 need to calculate the area and then after calculating the area we will divide that area by the length of the diagram and the spring constant of the instrument that is using a particular spring to calculate the pressures all right that is a little in depth right now we will let you know how and why mean effective pressure needs to be calculated because it has to be a steady force moving on the piston and the distance moved in the rpm so these are the parameters required to calculate the power one is the force one is the distance traveled one is the rpm that means time so torque multiplied by the time will give you the power so that is why we need to calculate that force and that force can only can be calculated by knowing what is the steady pressure on acting on the piston multiplied by the area gives you the force so that is how mean effective pressure is utilized okay there is a great variation in pressure in the cylinder during the cycle of operation but power is calculated on the basis of average or mean pressure that means the steady pressure acting on top of the piston to force it down 
this mean pressure is determined from the pv diagram or the indicator diagram the pv diagram is sometimes called indicator diagram sometimes it is called power card this power card and how to take will come in your sixth semester as of now we need to only understand how the engine works what are the names of the parts of the engine that's all the mean effective pressure is then correctly stated as indicated mean effective pressure all right just know that mean effective pressure is an average or theoretical pressure that is calculated from the indicator diagram that's all that's all you need to know as of now in your fifth semester if you have any questions ask i will clarify so that is your mean effective pressure it is a theoretical pressure and it is used to calculate the power of the engine because you don't have a steady force on the piston next what we have is various power ratings i had already told you about mcr and csr sir yeah what is it sir what sir why you said that the wall of the cylinder should not be thick because there will be there will the differential see when you have a hot glass uh, a drinking glass of water all right it is a thick glass if you put hot water inside what will happen it will crack it will crack immediately but if it is a thin glass and you put hot water in it nothing happens why because the heat transfer is not as effective in the thick glass so the inside of it will expand thermal stress no thermal stress yes. yes that is thermal stress see and uh, that and uh, the thin part won't be allowed because of the mechanical stress yes absolutely it has to have some strength okay so thank you mechanical stress thank you. you go you understood now it has to be thin enough to allow for heat yes sir. it was a little bit confusing okay okay no problem no problem you ask but make sure that the concept is very clear in your mind don't go away with doubts so it has to be thin enough and it has to be thick enough so it is a very contradictory situation it has to be thick enough to take the mechanical stress and it has to be thin enough to take the thermal stress that is why that is why the opposites have to be fulfilled so you have to have a compromise between the two okay let's move on various power ratings you have maximum continuous rating you have continuous service rating and you have overload rating i know i had explained a little bit of it mcr in the earlier lecture but i read it again and i found it is not going to be very clear to the students so let's write it down in the simplest language so it is easy to understand now what is maximum continuous rating maximum continuous is the maximum continuous output output meaning power output is the maximum continuous output at which the engine can be run safely and continuously remember this sentence from absolutely embossed in your mind it is the maximum output from the engine when it can be run safely and continuously that's all that safely is a very important word over there okay and continuously this is used to indicate the strength of the engine that means it is a powerful engine it is like a strong powerful engine so mcr is indicative of the power of the engine okay the only drawback about mcr is it runs continuously it is safe to run engine runs in very good condition exhaust is clear but only problem is fuel cost is more much more the concept uh, the consumption of fuel at mcr is high is high all right it is not that consumption of fuel is at low speed is low no it is low at low speed is lower at high speed so you have to find a belt during which consumption is low and the health of the engine is also very good that means all the fuel is burned perfectly no carbonization no extra heating no overload no no overheating no over stressing so where will you get this you will get it in the csr or ncr it is called continuous it's a spelling wrong continuous continuous okay continuous yeah spelling was wrong 
Okay. So uh, behind or uh, after MCR, you have CSR, uh, but CSR is also called normal continuous rating. That is also the term used. But CSR is more commonly used. Okay, now what is uh, CSR? CSR is basically the brick power that is provided, certified by the manufacturer, and it is measured at the power takeoff end. And at this power, the engine can be operated without reference to time limit. That means at this power, it can be run continuously and as long as you want. We have run this for 42 days. We were on a ship and that ship from Trinidad and Tobago. Where is Trinidad and Tobago? It is somewhere near the Caribbeans, near West Indies. And from there, we started, we came around Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, and up into Arabian Sea and into Kandla port in Gujarat. So it took us 42 days. We were we had loaded wheat and it was a bulk carrier. And I don't remember how many tons of wheat. The whole ship was fully loaded. And we ran 42 days non-stop from Trinidad and Tobago right up to Kandla. And there was no problem with the engines. The first thing we did after stopping the engine was try out astern movement before reaching the port. Well, in Anchorage, we stopped, we tried out Aston and again, and again Aston and again, moved the rudder port starboard, and then we told the pilot, yes, now we can come into the port. And then we went in the port, and then we did a normal routine. So continuous service rating is the healthiest rating for an engine. And it is the rating at which the power output from the engine can be drawn continuously without any limit. How many days you want to run, you run. Okay, that is the continuous service rating. This speed, continuous service rating, is regarded as economical for efficiency and corresponds to the thermal and mechanical load best suited from the maintenance point of view. In other words, the wear and tear of the engine is at the minimum the carbon deposits is also at the minimum. The engine stays cleanest at that point of time. And also your fuel oil, lube oil consumption is at their best levels, ideal level. That means minimum. Remember, running an engine at low speed is as damaging as running an engine on over speed or overload. Both. Both are very damaging. Best would be what CSR is, in some ships, it is 80 to 90% of MCR, or in some ships, it is 85 to 95% of the MCR. At this load, the engine runs in its healthiest condition. That's why diesel engines should never be run on part load conditions. It is very damaging. So you must run it at least 75% load. Okay, you may not make it 95% load, but 75% load. So it runs in a healthy condition. All the temperatures are well balanced. The loads, the physical loads are well balanced. The thermal loads obviously are all well balanced. The combustion of fuel is complete. That means no part of the fuel will remain unburned, mostly. And if it remains unburned, then carbon formation takes place. So at this CSR, nothing takes place. Of course, at MCR also nothing takes place. The only drawback at MCR is the fuel cost at MCR is much higher. So no, no ship owner wants to run his ship on MCR because the fuel cost is very high. So they will run it on CSR. At CSR, you're getting more or less the same benefits. And uh, in fact, your engine stays in a much healthier condition. Okay. So this is your MCR and CSR. Next, what you have is overload rating. Overload rating is the extent of overload above the MCR that can be safely exerted on the engine for a short duration of time. Here, see, the word safely has been put a little bold. I want to harp on this word. Under no circumstances, any time, whether it is 
maximum continuous reading or continuous service reading or overload reading should the safety element of running the engine be removed under no circumstances can you run an unsafe engine so that is why even in your overload rating you have safety implied in the process so overload rating is the extent of the overload above the mcr more than the maximum rating that can be safely exerted on the engine for a short duration of time i told you something about power safety factor or uh, power safety factor yes sir not power safety factor man yes sir you said it factor of safety i didn't tell you power safety i said told you factor of safety f o s remember this so because there is a factor of safety you can go above mcr all right and how much more than mcr it is the power at 10% in excess of mcr for a period of 1 hour in a period of 12 hours <clears throat> actually you never need to run this engine above mcr but during sea trials during commissioning of the ship every test is taken care of so including overloading the engine to see that the engine is capable of taking that overload and nothing happens to it that means it is still safe so that is why this overload rating is marked out in the technical file when the acceptance of the ship and engine is taken by the ship owner from the ship builder all right and what is this overload rating it is the power at 10% above the mcr for a period of 1 hour in a period of 12 hours that means in a period of 12 hours you can run it on overload only for 1 hour and the next 11 hours you cannot run it all right so next 1 hour again you can run it next 11 hours you cannot run it. so that is how overload rating is factored in the engine ratings okay so now you know what is mcr you know what is csr and you know what is overload rating okay now next point we need to go into is indicated power brake power and shaft power these are all fundamentals of an engine and you need to have it on your fingertips without this studying rest of the engine is of no relevance you become like a fitter on the ship then you know only ah this has to be hammered tight and that has to be loosened this has to be fitted why you are fitting it why you are tightening how the engine works those are fundamental information and which needs to be at the engineer's fingertips how to fit the valve and how to open the valve those are there. but you need to know why the valve has got a lift of d by 4 why can't it be d by 5 or d by 3 why does the valve lift of a normal stop valve be d by 4 why not d by 3 why not d by 5 okay you can write that question on your side as a general knowledge question in engineering why is the lift of an ordinary stop valve d by 4 and it is not d by 3 or d by 5 okay let's move on next what we have is indicated horsepower indicated horsepower is the actual power that is generated in the combustion chamber of the engine by the combustion of fuel so the power developed inside the cylinder is called the indicated power it is also a power which is not really available to you because indicated power is the maximum power that can be derived from the fuel that is being burned because some of the power is lost as heat energy into the exhaust into the cooling water into the lubricating oil etc if you remember your heat balance diagram there it is indicated how much is used as work so 37% we saw in that diagram was actually indicated power a little more than 37 power because that is work done so a little more than that about 40 42% is actually indicated power and 37 power is the power available 
at the output of the engine. So the difference between the output at the shaft of the engine and the power in the cylinder is the power consumed by the engine. You see, when the engine requires some power to move the parts, the crankshaft has to be rotated, the piston has to be moved, the torque has to be produced. These are all heavy components. So you need power which is consumed by the engine. Okay. So the difference between this power in the cylinder and the output power from the shaft is the power consumed by the engine. And this is called mechanical efficiency. So the power consumed by the engine is dependent on how much friction load is there between the piston and the liner or rather piston rings and the liner and also the resistance by friction by the bearings, all the bearings. So this power which is consumed by the engine is the difference between the indicated power and the brake power which is available at the output shaft of the engine. I hope it is reasonably clear what is indicated power. Indicated power is the power developed inside the cylinder of the engine. And then that power is transmitted through the engine to the outside of the engine for more work. Okay. And this difference between the what is available on the shaft at the brake hospice uh, at the output of the engine and the cylinder power is the power consumed by the engine. All right. Okay. This indicated power is calculated by the formula. What is the formula? That formula is something you will do in your sixth semester. And that instills, I'll tell you what it is. First, you need to take the indicator card or the PV diagram, pressure and volume diagram from each of the cylinders with the help of an instrument. And that instrument, you have a paper fixed into the drum and there is a scriber which will make the diagram. So you take out that paper, put it on a horizontal paper, and then you use an instrument called a planimeter, P-L-A-N-I-M-E-T-E-R meter, to go over the diagram to calculate the area. Once you calculate the area, you divide it by the length and the spring constant, and get a figure which is called the mean effective pressure. All right, this is the pressure Multiplied by the cross-sectional area gives you the force. And the force multiplied by the RPM and the stroke of the engine. Then you get the distance traveled at the required time. And that gives you your power. And this power is for that particular unit. Similarly, you need to take the power of each and every unit of the engine and then sum total the total power to give you the total mean indicated power of the engine. All right. So that is your MIP, mean indicated power, or indicated horsepower. That is also a common term. After horsepower comes your brake horsepower. This measures the power at the output shaft of the engine. Why is it called brake horsepower? Because the measurement of that power is done by a brake dynamometer. A brake dynamometer is a big instrument which has a restricting effect on the movement. It has a braking effect on the movement. This restricting effect is translated into power. And brake horsepower is known as brake horsepower because it is measured by means of a brake dynamometer. All right. That's why it's called a brake horsepower. That's the best answer I could get. Why is horsepower at the output of the engine called brake horsepower? Because it is measured by the help of a brake dynamometer. This brake dynamometer is available only in the builder's workshop. That means where the engine is being built, he will have a brake dynamometer to check what is his output power from a shaft and thereby with that he will be able to calculate the mechanical efficiency of his engine. How much resistance is there within the engine can be calculated once you know the brake power and once you know the indicated power. Okay. The difference between the indicated horsepower and the brake horsepower 
is the mechanical and frictional losses within the engine. Okay, I think it's quite easy to understand, not so difficult. Next is shaft horsepower. Shaft horsepower is the power available at the propeller at the end of the shaft. So between from the output of the engine to the point where the propeller shaft is, there will be bearings, there will be reduction gearing, maybe reduction gearing. There could be a power takeoff unit, which means through a gear and clutch arrangement, you run a generator. And that generator can be used to produce electricity out at sea. So you don't need to burn light diesel oil to produce electricity through an engine. You can use your heavy oil burning in your main engine to derive electricity, which is cheaper. Okay, so the shaft horsepower is the power delivered to the propeller shaft before being converted into thrust. And this is measured by means of a torsion meter. Now, how much power is being transmitted through a shaft will be gauged by finding out how much twist is there in the shaft. So a torsion meter basically has two sensors which are installed on the shaft and in line, completely in line, when it is stopped. Okay. Now, when the power is being transmitted or the shaft is being rotated, there will be a differential in the positions or locations circumferentially between the first sensor and the second sensor because the shaft will have some twist in it. This angularity of shift dependent on the modulus of elasticity of the shaft material and using that respective modulus of rigidity formula, you can calculate how much power is required to twist the shaft to the degree that has been measured. Based on this angle of twist, you can calculate your power. You have done strength of materials, so you should be able to answer this question. How is shaft power measured? Shaft power is measured by using a torsion meter. Okay, next, let's go ahead. Next, what we show you known what is IHP, BHP, and shaft horsepower, mean effective pressure. All right, all these are quite understandable to you. You'll have to revise it, no doubt. It's not able to act, absorb everything in one go. Next, what we have is definition of some engine parameters. What is mechanical efficiency of an engine? How do you know what is the mechanical efficiency? Mechanical efficiency is a measure of the mechanical perfection of that engine. That means how perfect the alignment of the piston and the crosshead and the connecting rod, how perfect is the crankshaft aligned? Because if these parts are not aligned, then the res resistance to motion becomes much more. Moment resistance to motion becomes more, more power is consumed by the engine to cause that engine to move. So it is very, very essential to have very good alignment of the parts of the engine and also minimize the friction between the rubbing surfaces. That means the lubricating oil quality has to be very good to minimize the friction. Otherwise, most of the power will go and running your engine only. Nothing will be available outside for work. Okay. So it is a measure of the mechanical perfection of the engine and numerically it is expressed as the ratio of the indicated power to the brake power. Okay. Next is, what is mechanical efficiency? It is the output at the crankshaft to the output at the cylinders. So it is measured by brake dynamometer at this point and it is measured by an indicator instrument which calculates the pressure and the area of the PV diagram and then through calculation you get the indicated horsepower. Okay. And difference between indicated horsepower and brake horsepower is the power sorry, consumed by the engine. Okay. Indicated power is calculated from indicator diagrams and are subject to significant errors. Yes, that is true. Because, you see, first and foremost, <clears throat> 
there are 1 million strokes of the piston taking place during the combustion process. Out of that, you take only one stroke and the pressure developed during that one stroke. What about the remaining strokes? You are not getting an average of 100 strokes or 1000 strokes. You are taking random at one stroke. What pressure is developed? Maybe there will be a slight difference in the pressure in the next stroke or the strokes thereafter. So you are taking for granted that any one stroke will give you the ideal figure. So the chance of error is there one. Number two, while calculating the area, the the effect, the function of that indicator instrument, if it's not 100% efficient, it will not give you 100% accuracy. So that is why the chances of error in making that is quite high. That is instrument drawback. What about the human factor? Chief engineer is also a human being. So when he is tracing that line on that PV diagram to calculate, his hand might shift a little bit on left or right side. And then thereafter, you will see that here his area is off by one square millimeter. And that one square millimeter will have a big bearing in the calculation of the power. So that possibility is there. And chances of human error is high. That is why indicated horsepower is, can be considered, yes, it is reasonably correct. But if you take it multiple times and come at the same figure, you can take an average value. So it will give you a reasonably good answer. But brake horsepower, it is absolutely perfect because it is measured by the engine by the human factor is very little except taking down what the readings are. That's all. So that is why brake horsepower calculation is much easier. Indicator power is calculated from the indicator diagram and are subject into errors. Brake horsepower is measured with about 98% accuracy by a dynamometer at the builder's works. That means at the builder's workshop and a torsion meter on board the ship. Frankly, I have never taken a, a shaft horsepower on board the ship. Neither I have seen any surveyor do it. But surveyors are expected to do it. And shipyard is also expected to do it during the sea trial program. That means when there is a sea trial, that time they will use the torsion meter and the sensors and find out. After that, nobody bothers at all. For the rest of the life of the ship or the engine, nobody bothers. What does the shaft horsepower give you? It gives you the losses from the brake horsepower up to the propeller shaft. Now, what are there over there? You will either have bearings and nothing else. So, what? how many pedestal bearings? They are called pedestal bearings or what are called plumber block. They are sometimes called plumber blocks. Those are the bearings which support the propeller shaft. So it is a loss over there and sometimes if you have a power takeoff unit, some power is taken from there. So that is the power loss. So ultimately, what is available at the shaft is only with a marginal drop from brake horsepower. Okay. Okay. Next, we go on to is volumetric efficiency. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, indicated horsepower contains the uh, thermal losses uh, in the line lining, means in, uh, due to jacket water cooling system. Indicated power contains no; those are losses. Those are losses. They can't be included here. They can't be considered as losses. I mean, they cannot be considered. Considered as the power, indicated power is the power built up in the cylinder liner, that's all. What is lost is lost. All right. That, uh, the losses can't be included in that power. Okay. Because it is generally arising from the heat generated from the fuel. And the heat generated from the fuel to cause that pressure is what is measured. But the heat which goes to the liner walls, uh, for cooling, what heat energy goes out to the exhaust is not converted to power. So only 
the heat energy in the fuel which is converted into uh, power is the pressures that are there in the cylinders the rest of it is lost the indicated power is much less than the power that is there in the fuel okay only part of the energy in the fuel is converted into indicated first power okay next what we have is volumetric efficiency and scavenge efficiency now these two parameters are indicative of how well the engine breathes if you can breathe well you have good volumetric efficiency but if you have some problem inside you if you are a little asthmatic or if you are a little got a bad throat and you are having difficulty in taking air then your volumetric efficiency drops okay now you get the concept of volumetric efficiency how well the engine breathes is indicated by volumetric efficiency and scavenge efficiency volumetric efficiency is for four stroke engines and air compressors and scavenge efficiency is indicative of two stroke engines the principle is both and both of them show how well you breathe or how well the engine breathes okay if somebody is not breathing well you can tell him hey your volumetric efficiency is being affected and during covid times your volumetric efficiency is very severely affected that is true so what is volumetric efficiency now before you read what is there let me first try to get you to understand what the concept is now a piston moves from tdc to bdc okay that volume which is covered by the movement of the piston is called the stroke volume it is not compression volume it is called stroke volume all right above the stroke volume you have something called clearance volume all right okay now under normal circumstances uh, say standard temperatures and pressures in chemistry i think that is 76 mercury uh, sorry 76 cm of mercury in an air pressure and what is the temperature uh anyway whatever it is so that is standard temperature and pressure there will be a certain mass of air inside that stroke volume all right engine is not running but you know what is stroke volume it is the distance that the piston travels inside the cylinder and the mass of air contained in that stroke volume at standard temperature and pressure suppose it is a all right just the figure a cubic centimeters that i said now when the engine is running it is running at a certain speed all right the air which comes into the cylinder is the stroke volume because that's the only volume that is made available when the piston moves from tdc to bdc so air will come into that is that mass of air equal to the mass of air when the engine is stopped and the temperature and pressure is a standard temperature and pressure no it is not what is coming in is definitely less than what is there at standard temperature and pressure so this ratio the mass of air induced in the cylinder divided by the mass of air at standard temperature and pressure is the volumetric efficiency i hope it is reasonably clear roma kumari are you there he is not there roma kumari are you there yes, have you yes, understood sir. what is volumetric efficiency yes sir yes sir you I don't know. sound very confident it is the volume or rather uh, here when we compare volumetric efficiency we actually take mass into consideration it is the mass of air induced in the cylinder compared to the mass in the stroke volume at standard temperature and pressure at standard temperature and pressure the mass is definitely little more than what is induced in the cylinder when the engine is running why is the induced mass of air less because now keep in mind air has a certain flow characteristic it is not like electricity 
that when you put on the switch, the light will come on immediately. It's not as effective as electricity travel. Air flow has its own characteristic and it takes its own time. One of the reasons is the pipeline into which it comes has certain walls and there is some friction. So the air which is coming over those walls is suffering some friction. And so there is some turbulence over there. And that turbulence causes a slowdown of the flow of air. This is one. And then there are bends and twists of the air ducting through which it comes. Of course, designers try to make it as smooth as possible. But even then, there is a bend. And at bends, if you have studied fluid dynamics, there will be some losses. All right. So ultimately, when it comes into the cylinder, it has to come past the valve. The inlet valve has to open. So it has to bypass or go around the valve and then come into the cylinder. So this flow path is full of restrictive conditions. These restrictive conditions cause a slowdown of the air to come in. Number one. Number two, the piston is moving at a certain pace. And this slowdown of the air coming in, by the time the piston comes down, not all air has come in, but the valves will close because the compression stroke has to start. So these are the reasons why the induced mass of air is little less than the mass of air contained in the stroke volume at standard conditions. And this ratio of the induced mass divided by the stored mass is 90%. And this volumetric efficiency being an indication of how well the engine is breathing is limited to four-stroke engines and air compressors. Remember, air compressors are similar to your engines. Only thing they don't have a fuel injector and their compression ratio is not as high as your engines. Otherwise, all you need to do is fit one fuel injector and it will work like an engine. Isn't it? The principle is the same. The compression, delivery of air, of course, and then coming. The clearance volume in an air compressor is much less than an engine. <coughs> it has to be very little. Otherwise, the efficiency of the compressor will drop. If it goes and compresses the air only and doesn't pump it out, and then again comes down, that OEM air will again expand. So that is why an air compressor has to have minimum clearance, maybe one millimeter at the most, 1.5, like that. Otherwise, the efficiency will be very poor. So I hope you have understood what is volumetric efficiency. And this is related to only four stroke engines and air compressors. Okay. Next, what we have is the scavenge efficiency. It is exactly the same as your volumetric efficiency, but here it is related to two stroke engines. And in this two stroke engine, the scavenging process is part or scavenging and exhaust part is part of the expansion and compression process. It is unlike the four stroke where the piston drives out the entire gases and drives in the full uh, uh, inlet air, fresh air, full, uh, full charge. In the two-stroke engine, part of the exhaust stroke and part of the compressed stroke embodies the exhaust and air inlet. So that is why the gas exchange process is not so efficient. Little bit of residual gas remains inside the cylinder. And because of that, the quantity of fresh air coming into the cylinder is much less than what we would get in the four-stroke engine. All right. So these are the reasons why you have scavenge efficiency, a little less in its numerical value as compared to volumetric efficiency. Of course, designs are being made, are the including the ports of the cylinder to which the air goes in, they are also angled to give the maximum swirling motion and collecting all the residual gases and getting them out. So all these improvements in the two-stroke engine have been embodied to help improve the scavenge efficiency. Okay. I hope if you have any questions on scavenge efficiency, volumetric efficiency, don't hesitate to ask. I'm going on to the next slide.
again we come back to compression ratio this is i uh, actually uh, while i'm making the powerpoint program i realized that something is little missing something has to be added and i've already put up that powerpoint now it becomes troublesome to again change the continuity so a little uh, revising of compression ratio it is the ratio of the volume of air at the start of compression remember it is not from bdc to tdc is not the compression ratio why because if you see in the timing diagram of whether two stroke or you take four stroke that timing diagram indicates the piston has moved up a little bit before the compression starts about 30 35 degrees of movement has already been completed before the compression actually starts so compression ratio is the ratio of the volume of air at the start of compression to the volume of air at the end of the stroke that means the tdc all right so it is not from bdc to tdc that gives you your compression ratio the usual minimum value for compression ignition engine is 12 is to 1 that i have been harping again and again and again now you must be sick of that number also so if anybody tells you 12 your head will start ringing at 12 it is already 12 o'clock like this say for as a humor okay the clearance volume in any engine is usually 8% of the stroke volume all right i don't know what is the clearance volume of an air compressor i didn't uh, okay i need to find out let me make a note of it there are certain questions that come to mind at certain times what is the clearance volume in a uh, air compressor is the volume in a compressor i have to find out this there are so many questions whose answers i don't know i also have to find out even at this stage i am going through a learning process there are so many things i need to learn from you like ravi prakash has taught me how to do the sharing of the link okay so now let's go on to stoichiometric ratio this is actually a big word but the real meaning is very simple it is the air and fuel required for complete combustion it is the mass of air required for burning unit mass of fuel completely so that is the meaning of stoichiometric ratio and the usual value for a hydrocarbon fuel is 14.7 it may vary a little bit 14.5 to 14.9 and 15 in different fuels some fuels may require more oxygen to burn some may require less oxygen but the usual figure is 14.7 it means 14.7 kg of air is required for every kg of fuel burnt this is the theoretical value remember in practice we do not use 14.7 we give almost double almost 30 kg of air for every kg of fuel that we burn why because air is free we don't have to pay for the air but we have to pay for the fuel so what fuel we burn every part of that fuel should be utilized that is the objective and that can be utilized if we burn the fuel completely by the time the piston reaches its exhaust stroke or commences its exhaust stroke okay i need to drink some water yeah just give me a moment please let me bring some water okay so remember the air fuel ratio is a theoretical concept and it is usually 14.7 need refilling okay in actual engines you will give much more of air than 14.7 you give almost 
in boilers it is almost 50 kg of air for every kg of fuel burned in gas turbines it is 60 so 14.7 is only a theoretical value when you do your chemistry calculations that what is the mass of air burning up? how much fuel will you use 14.7 okay next is ah now we are coming to 1044 we have come really fast we are going into general description let us proceed with this also we have enough time another 20 minutes so we will start off with the general any i hope the what i have taught you in the previous those are fundamentals all right there will be a few more fundamentals like i have already given you to find out the meaning of flash point fire point ignition point core point and cloud point i hope i am not going to ask you but it is your responsibility to know all these today i will give some questions on uh, uh, probably multi choice questions that makes it very interesting but then you need to also draw diagrams in your examinations so you will need to practice so anyway let's proceed with the principal components now once you read this or once i tell you what the components are you need to improve your technical knowledge by knowing the names of the parts engine has so many parts the major parts are what we will deal with and we will try to describe what their function is and what they are expected to do the bottom most part of the engine has what is called bed plates that is called the bed plate and this bed plate holds the crankshaft in place this bed plate we will go to the description much later let's finish the list this is the bottom most part a frames are mounted on top of the bed plates all right and these a frames are mainly for two stroke engines for four stroke engines you have what are called blocks engine blocks and this engine block just has a sump which is integral in the two stroke engine the sump is not integral it is a plate or fitting at the bottom okay let's move one at a time so bed plate is the bottom most part which houses the crankshaft above the crankshaft you have the a frame which is in two stroke engine arranges for holding the cross head this is the most important part it holds the cross head in position it holds the crankcase doors in position it holds the crankcase relief valves in position and that's about all and the end of the a frame has got a diaphragm that means the top end of the a frame has a diaphragm which holds the stuffing box okay so that is the a frame next you have is the cylinder heads actually no cylinder head should have come much later okay actually entablature comes after that anyway cylinder heads are the topmost part of the engine and they can be taken out and put back quite frequently because they are held in place by means of studs and on the cylinder heads you have various mountings similar to boiler having mountings cylinder head also has some mountings all right the valves injectors etc we will come to that later the cylinder liner is the liner or the sleeve in which the piston is able to move and this cylinder liner is mounted in the cylinder jacket or what is called entablature this entablature is in only two stroke engines all right so you have the cylinder cover seated on top of the entablature and it is bolted by studs which are protruding from the entablature okay next inside the engine cylinder liner you have what is the piston assembly now the piston assembly has the piston the skirt the piston rings that's all in the two stroke engines in the four stroke engine it has the piston the gudgeon pin the gudgeon pin bush and the connecting rod attachment that is in the four stroke engine i'll give you a diagram just now it becomes clearer when you see the diagram first let's read the names of the parts 
Next, what you have is a cross end. This cross end bearing is there only in long stroke, two stroke engines. Request regarding lecture upload. You, Shivastav. Yes, we will upload it. Don't worry. Let us first finish the lecture. Don't jump a gun. I will share everything. Don't worry. I want you fellows to do very well. You are in competition with the other colleges. And if they turn out to be better than you, then I want to sink into the ground. I don't want to exist. So you have to do very well. Your well-being is my well-being. So I will share with you everything and so that, but you also have to absorb the subject. So these are the names of the part. You know what is a crosshead? Crosshead is a means of attachment of the piston rod and the connecting rod. It is required in engines which have a long stroke. It is held in position by means of guides and guide shoes. It has a vertical, mo vertical sliding motion and allows for angular motion of the connecting rod and reciprocating motion of the piston rod. I hope you can say this much. What is a cross head? It is not an angry head. It is a part of a two-stroke engine which joins the piston rod and the connecting rod. And it enables vertical motion to be translated into angular and rotary motion of the connecting rod. All right. It is held in position by means of the guides and guide shoe. All right. It takes the transverse, if you want to say more, it takes the transverse thrust of the angularity of the connecting rod. Okay. There's so much you can say, but you need to know what it is first. Okay. Next is connecting rod and bottom end bearing. The top end of the connecting rod is holding the cross head bearing and the bottom end of the connecting rod is holding the bottom end bearing or big end bearing or crank pin bearing. These are the same things. The bottom end bearing is also called crank pin bearing. It is also called big end bearing. And of course, it is also called bottom end bearing. Okay, next is you have is the crankshaft. The crankshaft consists of webs, crank pins, journals, and of course, there are bearings to support that crankshaft. Other than this, you have what is called the camshaft. The camshaft is part of the engine and it is driven by the crankshaft either through a chain drive or through several gear drives. And the speed of the camshaft and the crankshaft is the same in two-stroke engine and the speed of the crankshaft is twice that of the camshaft in the four-stroke engine. Oh, that part you have not confused. Tie rods are long tie rods which hold the bed plate, A-frame and entablature, all of them under compression. It holds them together, gives rigidity to the engine and, and provides alignment to all the components. It gives rigidity, it gives alignment, and the third thing, it takes up the combustion forces. You see, the combustion forces are acting in the combustion chamber. All right. The forces are upward and downward. What is sideways is negated because the whole thing is circular. So sideways, the forces are balanced out with each other in the opposite directions. But vertically, what is being gas pressure acting on the underside of the cylinder cover is upwards and what is acting on the piston is downwards. Okay. Now these upwards and downward direction forces, they have to be held together and that holding is done by the tie rods. How? Okay. This force under the piston, under the cylinder cover will cause the cylinder cover to be blown off. But the cylinder cover is held in place by means of studs and nuts which are held in the cylinder jacket or the entablature. The studs are fitted on the inner. So the whole entablature will be pulled up, but the entablature, A-frame and bed plate are held together by 
thyroids compression so the force causing the studs to lift up on the entablature or the entablature to lift up is restricted by means of the thyroids okay so the entablature tends to go upward but the thyroid holds it downward now downward when the force of the piston is translated to the main bearing through the carotid bearing and bottom end bearing is ultimately going on the bed plate all right the downward force is on the bed plate but the bed plate is held upward by means of the tie rods so you see the upward forces and downward forces are both held together by means of the tie rod so when the engine is running remember the tie rod that you see is doing a lot of work and that work is it is already pre tensioned when it is fitted but when it is working it is being pulled up release pulled up release pulled up release for each combustion stroke so that is why it is called it is having a fluctuating stress okay otherwise everybody believes that the tie rods are like part of you know the engine block it has no function there is no stress it is subject to fatigue failure now that gives me a good question to ask you and uh, explain why fatigue failure can take place in a tie rod very good question i have never put this question anywhere i am putting it to you explain how tie rods are subject to fatigue failure they are subject to fatigue failure and i have experienced one particular engine one particular ship whose engine had a fatigue failure of a tie rod and i was working in calcutta docking and engineering company it is on taratala road only towards the end and there we were told to go to a ship and remove a tie rod but that story i will tell you later let's go on to our next part camshaft and tire so these are the names of all the parts of the engine and let's have a little diagram here this is called a crosshead engine i have shown you earlier this is a trunk type of engine which is generally a four stroke it can be a four stroke and a two stroke also so don't think that this can only be four stroke can be a two stroke engine also two stroke engine need not have a crosshead if the stroke is not very long if the stroke is short fine but if the stroke is long then you need to have a crosshead okay what are the parts now he is saying here piston and line are lubricated with cylinder oil on total total consumption what is total consumption? cylinder oil is used for lubrication so this is your cylinder this is your piston and the lubrication between them is through cylinder oil next one is piston rod you can see the piston rod here this piston rod is what provides the sealing at this particular point and it keeps the oil of the cylinder upward and it keeps the crankcase oil downwards so this stuffing box helps in separating the two spaces the under piston spaces as well as the crankcase spaces okay next you have is the crosshead guide so i told you the crosshead guide is fitted inside the a frames and it allows the crosshead to move vertically up and down so next you have is the connecting rod so the connecting rod is this one what you see and this is the crosshead bearing okay or next is what you see sorry is the crankshaft that these are the parts of the engine as we go into more diagrams we'll show you more parts of the diagram all right let's move a little more now two stroke engines are mostly large crosshead type of engine unidirectional that means they rotate continuously in one directional <coughs> low speed direct driven it is not you know that in both direction it can run direct driven and residual burning engines and they are reversible also and reversible and
and reversible. Why is engine on the red line? Okay. So mostly large cross-set type, unidirectional, low speed. Why is it unidirectional? It is in both directions. What does unidirectional mean? Anyway, leave it at that at the moment. Remember, the engine can rotate in both directions. Most engines can rotate. Marine engines can rotate, except for auxiliary engines. They cannot rotate. They do not have reverse cams. Okay. Bed plate. A frame. What is reverse? Cam? Reversible means the engine will can reverse and it has got ahead cams and astern cams. Your auxiliary engines will not be uh, reversible. That they should be one directional. Let's remove this word unidirectional. Unidirectional means only in one direction, which is not right. Okay, mostly large cross-set type, low speed, direct driven, industrial burning and reversible. That means the engines can be reversed in their direction of rotation, ahead and astern. Next have is the bed plate, A-frames and entablature are held together in compression by tie rods. Okay, bed plate, A-frames and entablature are held together by in compression by tie rods. Guide and guide shoe enables alignment and sliding movement of the crosshead assembly. Have a look at this diagram again. Of course, the tie rods are not shown here. I will show you the tie rods in another diagram. Now, this is the bed plate over here. This is the A-frame over here. And this is the <coughs> entablature. The cylinder head is separate. This is the cylinder head. It is a separate body altogether and it is not held by the tie rod. Remember, tie rod is holding only entablature, A-frame and bed plate together. I have a diagram which is right down below. Yeah. This is what it is. This is the tie rod and this is the entablature, which is the A-frame and this is the bed plate. All right. So these are the forces upward caused by the gas pressures and these are the reacting pressures acting on the bed plate. So based on this, these, this is how actually this diagram should have been right on top. Anyway, let us come on to this point. So bed plate, A-frame and enter. Don't make the mistake of saying cylinder heads are held by the tie rods. Cylinder heads are not. Cylinder jacket is. There's a difference between cylinder jacket and cylinder head. Cylinder jacket is around the cylinder and cylinder head is on top of the cylinder. All right. So these two are separate components. Cylinder jacket is held by the tie rod. Cylinder head is not held by the tie rod. Okay. Guide and guide shoe enables alignment, alignment and sliding movement of the crosshead assembly. Main bearings hold the crankshaft in alignment in place. That means your crankshaft is held in place by the <coughs> main bearings which are inside the bed plate. Okay. Little uh, two more diagrams I'll show and then we'll call it a day. Otherwise, the information overload comes on you. These are the main parts of the two-stroke engine. This diagram I think I've shown you earlier also. So this is your scavenge manifold. You can see I try to make it bigger. Let's make it bigger. Yeah, that's bigger. So this is your scavenge manifold. This is your under piston space. This is your piston. This is your combustion space. This is your piston rod. This is your cross head. The connecting rod is not visible completely because the A frames have come into the way. These A frames are actually coming in the way. So you cannot see the connecting rod. Connecting rod is behind the A frame. And then you have the stuffing box over here. So combustion space and scavenge space are separated from the crankcase by a diaphragm plate. Yes, these are the upper two spaces and they are separated by a diaphragm. This is the diaphragm and the pressure above the diaphragm and the pressure below the diaphragm 
are entirely different. The space inside the crankcase is almost atmospheric pressure, slightly more than atmospheric pressure, whereas the space above the diaphragm is equal to the scavenge pressure and sometimes more than the scavenge pressure. All right. The piston rod is bolted to the piston and passes through the stuffing box. You see, this piston rod is a rigid body and it is rigidly fixed to the uh, piston onto the piston and that rod is stuck to the cross uh, to the is uh, bolted to the crosshead and the crosshead is sliding inside the guide and guide shoe and the crosshead also holds the connecting rod at the top end and allows for some swivel action okay the stuffing box provides the seal between the two spaces which two spaces the under piston spaces and the crankcase spaces all right Here's another diagram to give you a clearer picture. The scavenge space is over here. This thing is scavenge space. This is actually under, actually over here, you will have a lot of scavenge valves. In this diagram, they have simplified it so much that they have removed the scavenge valves altogether. So you see the air comes in here. It has to come through valves and come here. And then it has to go into the inlet port. This is the inlet port, what you see. And this is the exhaust valve. So this diagram is only a you know, representative diagram showing you the main parts of the engine. All right. We will keep it uh, close till today. We have done till 15. Uh, uh, Ravi or uh, Prashant or uh, Prasam, you will have to remind me in the next class that we have come up to plate 15. And after plate 15, we will go on to plate 16 and next class we will try and complete this full powerpoint program so i can share the whole powerpoint program to you today's lecture you send me or i will follow, try to follow up what ravi prakash has said to make a folder of videos according to the section uh that can be eloquent share the link there'll be a huge amount of already boys some of the boys complained sir why recording the lecture all my space in my cell phone is gone. So that can't be the case. So you'll have to get the link so you can get directly to the drive, Google Drive, and be able to read it. Okay. As of now, it will be today will be the end of the class and we will continue again later. Let me take a little breather before I start the next class at 11.20. I barely have 20 minutes more and section B is already waiting, waiting in the gallery. So Till now, so much is the case. Be sure about the fundamentals. Mean effective pressure, indicated horsepower, brake horsepower, shaft horsepower, volumetric efficiency, scavenge efficiency. These should be at your fingertips. Okay. Roma has got a question. So you said tie rod hold the bed plate upwards against the downward. <coughs> hold the bed plate against the downward force communicated why the connecting rod and diagram doesn't clarify it. Explain. Okay. Okay. Let me show that last diagram. Okay. Now, yeah. Oops. Become very large. Okay, Ruma, how I look at this diagram. Ooh. Oh, my God. Sorry. I'm not so expert. Okay, a little smaller. Okay, have a look at this diagram. Oh, the whole thing has shifted. Okay, have a look at this diagram. You see, when the gas forces act inside the combustion chamber, they push the cylinder cover upwards. All right. If the cylinder's bolt, cylinder head studs were not there, the cylinder cover would have blown off. Those studs are actually bolted onto the entablature. All right. So the forces on the studs are coming on the entablature. So the entablature is being pulled upwards. Okay. If the entablature is being pulled upward because of the gas pressures inside the combustion chamber, they are being restricted from movement by the tie rods, which have got the bolt over here. Right on top, you see there are two bolts, or uh, sorry, two nuts, which are holding the tie bolts in place. And you can see, that the entablature, the A-frame, and the bed plate are held by long studs with bolts at the end. 
with bolts at, with nuts at the end. See this nut over here, nut here, nut here, nut here. So these nuts are like nuts at the end of long studs. So this is what is holding in the under compression. When the firing takes place, the gas pressures tend to lift the cylinder cover, but the cylinder cover is bolted to the entablature. So the entablature tries to lift upwards. Okay, that is the upward force on the tie rod. Now the downward force of the gas pressure is acting on top of the piston. The piston is forcing downward and ultimately the downward force is coming through the connecting rod and onto the crankshaft and the crankshaft is forcing the bed plate downwards. All right. Now if that force downward has to be held upward, it is again being held up by the tie rods. You see, the tie rods are bolted here. So the forces on the crankshaft are being downward and the forces in the cylinder cover are upwards. So both these forces, upwards and downward forces, are held in place by means of the tie rods. All right. Now think of a tin can. Okay. If you have a tin can with a cover on it and you have a explosion inside, so the force will be upwards and downwards. There'll be no undue increase of force of the tin can on the ground, isn't it? Now, you see a Coca-Cola bottle. It has got gas pressure inside. All right. The gas pressure is acting on the upper side of the lid and it is acting on the bottom part of the plate. But does it increase the weight of the bottle? It does not. If you remove the cap, let the gas out, it still seems the same. If you pressurize it and put the cap, it does not increase the weight of the bottle. It does not increase the force of the bottle downwards on the foundation bolts. Okay. Now read here. The tie bolt holds the cylinder block a frame and the bed plate in compression. Okay. The gas forces from the combustion are balanced off in the upward and downward directions. No extra forces are suffered by the foundation bolts of the bed plate. The upward forces of the cylinder cover are taken up by the studs which are bolted to the entablature. Right. The downward forces are taken on the piston, piston rod, connecting rod, crankshaft to the bed plate. The tie rods are subject to fluctuating stresses during each combustion cycle. I hope that should be clearance enough or a clear understanding. Roma, have you understood? Okay, very good. Very good. Okay, that will be all for today. Give, let me take a breather before the other section starts at 11.20. Okay, so stay safe, stay clear, get your concepts of the engine very, very clear. And one part you have to be very clear about is learn the terms, the names of the components correctly so that you don't make any mistakes. Till then, we call it a day. Okay, stop recording. <laughs>